The simple truth is that children kill. Of course, accidents do happen, but kids have proven themselves to be undoubtedly capable of cold-blooded, premeditated murders that they had every opportunity to avoid committing, but engage in nonetheless. Children have killed their parents, neighbors, classmates, and strangers. Kids have murdered their best friends, teachers, grandmas, and even their own babies. Children have killed alone and in groups, with other kids and sometimes with adults too. Who can even begin to speculate as to how people can justify resorting to murder? Not us. This show focuses on the facts, details, and circumstances which give rise to murderous minors, killer kids. Episode number two, The Wrestling Defense. It's July 28th, 1999, and bubbly, vivacious six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch is being looked after by her mother's friend, a Florida state trooper. Tiffany is the only child of Deweese Eunuch Paul, and the pair had recently settled in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida area. It is here that she became friendly with an old acquaintance, Kathleen Grosset Tate, and the two begin watching each other's kids while the other work. Considering that they are both single mothers, sharing child care seemed like a blessing, especially because Kathleen worked the graveyard shift. Kathleen Grosset Tate was a member of the United States Armed Forces, as was her son's father, whom she divorced when their child was one. That child, Lionel Tate, was forced to endure prolonged periods of separation from his mother all throughout his early childhood years, leaving him with deep psychological scars and frustration. Teachers back to kindergarten stated when interviewed that they expected Lionel to grow up encountering behavioral and disciplinary issues. However, no one could ever begin to foresee the severity of what would occur within a few short years. They say he was starved for attention and tried too hard to impress others through a disruptive attitude. He was known to quietly initiate confrontations and taunt classmates using aggressive bully behavior. It was reported that he repeatedly stole from classmates and the other children regularly refused to sit by him. When Lionel is about nine years old, he moves from Florida to Mississippi for a year or so to live with his father while his mother trains for and completes the process of becoming a Florida state trooper. He returns to a home where his mother works long hours with little time left over to spend with him. Upon his return to Florida, he is a much larger, much more aggressive version of the 11-year-old he was when he had left the previous year. By 1999, Lionel is a 12-year-old loner and begins spending considerable time with Tiffany Eunuch and her mother, Deweese, being looked after by them but also helping his mom babysit Tiffany. Now an older elementary school student, Lionel's behavior was described as aggressive. He was labeled an instigator. When confronted with his inappropriate behavior, Lionel routinely deflected blame toward others and Kathleen Grosset Tate always took his side. In response to disciplinary action at school, his mother would appear in her state trooper's uniform, armed, and engage in confrontations with teachers in the halls in full view of students and other spectators. On the evening of July 28, 1999, Tiffany is at the Tate's condo being babysat while her mom is at work. Around 7.30 p.m., Kathleen makes dinner for the kids and goes upstairs to rest before reporting to her graveyard shift as a Florida State Trooper. At around 11 p.m., Lionel comes upstairs to tell his mom that his little friend Tiffany wasn't breathing. According to her 911 call, Kathleen Grosset Tate states that she hadn't checked on the kids for about three hours. She goes on to say that she did get up and tell the kids to quiet down once, but she didn't think it was necessary to go down and see what they were doing. 
which she describes hearing with some kind of moaning. However, she didn't classify the noises to investigators as crying or as screaming. Loving, boisterous six-year-old Tiffany would later be pronounced dead at the hospital. Investigators would say that no foul play was suspected. At first glance, it appeared to be either some kind of choking accident or perhaps natural causes. The medical examiner concluded that little Tiffany's 48-pound body had sustained more than 35 blunt force trauma injuries, including a crushed skull, brain contusions, broken ribs, and a shredded liver. Injuries so severe as to be consistent with a fall from a second to third story window. The initial questioning by police took place at the Tate condo on the night of the crime. No implausible explanations were noted and foul play was not yet suspected prior to the coroner's findings. Once the autopsy report was complete, however, investigators immediately ruled Tiffany's death a homicide. Keeping in mind the babysitter's young yet large son, they seek out Lionel Tate and find him at the home of Tiffany's soon-to-be stepfather. He allows Lionel to leave with the police, unaccompanied by any legal guardian, with no one being required to give consent for interrogation in 1999 Florida. Lionel states that he and Tiffany were playing tag after dinner when 178-pound Lionel grabbed her from behind and squeezed. Investigators now begin to record the interview. Tiny, 48-pound Tiffany grabs the side of her body consistent with her liver and cries out. She then hits her leg on the metal stairs, darting to the bathroom, where she vomits. Lionel Tate further states that, upon returning from the bathroom, Tiffany says she is tired, lays down on the couch, and goes to sleep. Her head was in a position which Lionel thought looked uncomfortable, so, per his recorded statement, he straightens her head. But when he removes his hand, her head hits the coffee table, prompting her to scream out once more. Evidently, this is the commotion reported by Kathleen Grosset Tate, which resulted in her hollering down for the kids to be quiet but not going down to check on them. Lionel reported to her that Tiffany was making baby noises in her sleep. Kathleen then threatened to spank Tiffany if she didn't stop. The noises ceased. At some point after this occurs, Lionel says he simply notices Tiffany isn't breathing, leading him to alert his mother. He tells investigators that he did not tell his mother about playing tag, squeezing Tiffany, her banging her leg, the vomiting, or her hitting her head on the table. He only reports to his mother that Tiffany isn't breathing and she calls 911. Based on this interview, the day after Tiffany's tragic death and just after they have reviewed the coroner's report, law enforcement determined that 12-year-old Lionel Tate's deliberate actions caused six-year-old Tiffany Eunuch's fatal injuries and ultimately her untimely death. The public was in an uproar. Governor Jeb Bush and the Reverend Al Sharpton made statements. Even the Pope and the U.N. had something to say. With the okay of Tiffany's mother, Prosecutor Padowitz carefully prepared a plea offer that he thought seemed more than fair and just given the circumstances. Three years in juvenile prison. Ultimately, it was Kathleen Grosset Tate's final decision. Shockingly, she rejected the offer, along with any implication that her son was guilty. She contended that he was completely innocent, regardless of the evidence which would be presented at trial or his own descriptions of violence against his playmate. The prosecution gave the Tates multiple opportunities to take this plea, which they steadfastly refused, and the case went to trial. During the months between indictment and the beginning of the trial, 
Prosecutor Padowitz kept offering the plea, which they never accepted. During pretrial motions, the judge would end up severely limiting the amount of pro-wrestling-related conjecture that could be presented to the jury, stating a lack of generally accepted standard for the use of this defense. How effective could the defense possibly be now? Jim Lewis would end up being allowed to show just two clips depicting pro-wrestling moves similar to those which Lionel stated he had used on Tiffany. The defense also goes on to call an expert witness and forensic pathologist, who states that Tiffany's horrible injuries could indeed have been caused by the wrestling moves Lionel said they had mimicked. However, on cross-examination, he finds it necessary to admit that those injuries caused to Tiffany could not have been unintentional or accidental in any way. They would have had to have been inflicted on purpose. When the defense calls Lionel's mother Kathleen to the stand, her demeanor and description of her behavior on the night of the crime do little to draw sympathy from the jury for her child. The prosecution had actually presented their evidence first, such as the autopsy results and the speculative evidence regarding the crush Lionel may have had on Tiffany's mom. Even further damaging testimony came from a court-appointed psychologist who had conducted three interviews with Lionel following his arrest. Interestingly, he noted that, prior to the retention of Jim Lewis as his defense attorney, Lionel never mentioned wrestling, play fighting, roughhousing, or the WWF in any capacity whatsoever. He simply told him that they were playing, one of them fell, and the other tripped over them. Only after the notion that the wrestling defense was to be used was made public did Lionel begin to describe it to the psychologist. He was particular to note that Lionel had full comprehension that what he saw on television wrestling was fake, and that it performed in real life, people would be seriously injured. The testimony of Tiffany's mother, DeWeese, included the recollection that when she had told Lionel that Tiffany had died, he rolled his eyes and shrugged. She also contended that the day after Tiffany's death, Lionel had asked if he could move in with her and have Tiffany's toys. However, she does testify that the two kids were friends and had an affection for one another. In reality, the prosecution had been first to submit portions of the defense's own video, the one in which Lionel acted out the moves he had allegedly performed on his tiny playmate. The prosecution wanted to highlight that the amount of force necessary to injure little Tiffany so severely could not have possibly been inflicted by what was shown on the video. Even before the defense had a chance to try and convince the jury that this was a possibility, the prosecution did their best to discredit the theory. Lionel Tate was convicted on the charge of first-degree murder in January 2001. In March, he received the sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Had his mother accepted the plea deal which had been offered to them so many times before trial, he would by now be finishing up his three-year sentence with just ten years of probation required after. Instead, he was looking at a life sentence at the age of 14 with no possibility of parole. At sentencing, both the defense and the prosecution appealed to the judge for a reduction in charge so a lesser sentence could be imposed. However, Judge Joel Lazarus described 12-year-old Lionel's actions against innocent Tiffany as cold, callous, and indescribably cruel, and expounded that Tate's guilt was clear, obvious, and indisputable. There would be no reduction in charge, and a life without parole sentence would be historically imposed. In 2003, on appeal, Lionel's life sentence was overturned on the grounds that no mental competency hearing had been performed in preparation for trial. He was granted a new trial, but instead... Prosecutor Padowitz found it just and lawful to reoffer the same second degree murder plea deal that Lionel's mother had rejected many times before. In order to accept the plea, Lionel had to admit guilt, which he did, 
pleading guilty to second-degree murder.